and welcome to Nerds on Ice, the show where cool nerds get fired up about today's hottest topics. I am Tommy D, your uh, your standby host. Our uh, our beloved Chris Fury is off once again doing something to uh, defend the universe against all manner of tyranny and evil. So we're going to jump into it. Uh, this week we are going to be, of course, uh, saluting those brave men and women, those heroes um, who saved lives and unfortunately lost lives during 9-11. So we want to acknowledge them and uh, and all of that. So we're going to be, you know, talking about that. Of course, it's a very serious topic. Um, we've also, we're also very, very fortunate to be joined by an all-veteran panel this week. And uh, we're going to be talking about just all manner of things veteran related um, to include possibly if we have time for it we're going to be talking about the representation or misrepresentation of military in movies tv shows even comic books and things so let's go on around the panel here and uh, introduce all of our fine fine veterans so first up we've got richard phillips He's a Cleveland area actor married for 39 years to Carol and has raised three beautiful daughters, all college graduates, Air Force veteran, and this is amazing to me, survived 36 and a half years delivering mail right here in Northeast Ohio. That is hardcore. Richard, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. I, I don't know how you did it. 36, I barely last one, one winter here in Northeast Ohio. 36 and a half out there in it, man. That's incredible. You get, you get, you get used to it. You get used to it. Well, you early in the season, like it's all relative, you know, like we go from like, well, Cleveland, you don't have, we don't have much of a summer, you know, just, I mean, spring, I'm sorry. <laughs> Our spring is almost like an extension of winter anyway. Anyway, right. but if, if you get like uh, 30 degrees, it's cold because you're used to like warmer weather. But then later it's not bad because then it's 20 below. So right. it's all relative, you know. So then once you go to 20 below, you know, 40 below ain't bad because 20, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so it's okay. You kind of adjust, you climatize, you know. So and I like to use that word because I, when I was in the military, I trained with the Green Berets in the jungles of Panama. Oh, okay. And going from up north to the equator, that's what they they were teaching us to climatize our bodies because that's a big change, you know. <laughs> that pressure, you know, and stuff like that, you know. No doubt, and see, and that's between. But it's all government service, and government service makes us say crazy things like that, like, "Oh, forty below? Ah, it's not that bad." You know, it could be sixty below. I mean, it could always be worse. <laughs> well, so, I was out. The coldest I was out was seventy-five below zero wind chill effect. Come on. And that, my left thigh started to freeze. That's like when you spit and it's frozen before it hits the ground, right? I mean, that's <laughs> that's that level. Jeez. Well, yeah, Richard, I, Richard, thanks for joining us. Um, man, we've got a lot to talk about. <laughs> we okay. got a lot to talk right. about. Um, wow. 75 bullets. Jeez. Oh, my God. Uh, also joining us, you, you know him. You love him. He's been on here once or twice. He's a man who needs no introduction, but we're going to do it anyway. Mr. Deacon, host of the Mr. Deacon Experience. Um, how's it going? Man, it's it's lovely. You know, tomorrow is my birthday. Your birth so you're gonna be you're gonna be 40- eighty two, man. Eighty two. Yeah, and you don't look a day over ninety. <laughs> there you go. So Mr. Deacon is a former leatherneck and grunt. So he served in the USMC and the US Army. Correct. So that is outstanding. Well done. Graduate of the Ohio Media School. I remember yes, I remember indeed. that. You you're a Virgo. <laughs> this is what I've got on your bio. You're really, we're doing Zodiac signs for you now. <laughs> <laughs> it is what it is. A Virgo power, man. He's a Virgo who enjoys long walks on the beach and staring at the sunset with someone special. Yes, is that it? Yes. Yeah. So you can follow Mr. Deacon um, on Instagram at the Mr. Deacon experience. And of course, iHeart and Spotify to hear all of that lovely, lovely stuff going into your ear holes. Um, do not listen to the Mr. Deacon experience around children. Ever. <laughs> Ever. Period. Don't do I'm it. I'm trying. I'm trying. You know what I'm saying? I'm trying. You're trying to make it worse? No, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, you know what I'm saying. No, I I'm don't trying mean, to. You're trying to clean it up. My dad listened to it. He was like, I had to turn it off. Oh. I was like, 
Yeah, you know, don't let it is what it is. Don't let pops I, I, I've, I've, I've I've eased up, man. Yeah. All right. It's still a great show. Thank you. It's still a great show. (laughs) Also joining us this week, we have Vaughn Sample. Uh, He is a U.S. Navy and Navy Reserve veteran. So what is that, 13 years combined service? Is that correct? Yeah, somewhere in there. I I lost count. Yeah, I lost count. So fun fact, uh, Vaughn was able to recruit four of his friends into joining the Navy, all of which stayed active duty for many, many years after he actually got out. Um, And... uh, and everyone's happy and appreciative of uh, the work that you did for them. Yes. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. It's uh, it's still gratifying to get called up on their anniversaries or different things that happen for them in their careers throughout you know the decades, and still they they bring these things up. So I get introduced to their family members like I'm some guest of honor. <laughs> so it's it's funny. I love it though. I, I, I'm just glad that I was able to convince them to do something that's you know something different in their lives so right. i'm glad it worked out that's yeah. great that's great and it, you literally helped change their lives for the best yes yeah and that's what they always tell me right because growing up how we did we were on a path of destruction right yeah. <laughs> so it was a saving grace kind of a situation no for us, so, so you are you are absolutely a hero on multiple levels Oh, man, we'll talk about that on on different levels in all different areas. That's all right. That's all right. Love it. Love it. And last but certainly not least, it is a a woman who is very near and dear to my heart and to a lot of other people's hearts, uh, Miss Olivia Queener. Um, Oh, yeah. (laughs) Emphasis on the word queen, ladies and gentlemen. Emphasis on the word queen. Uh, U.S. Navy veteran. She's also the proud owner of two axolotos, and those are Mexican walking fish. Yes, yes they have feet. They have feet. They walk around the yeah, house. You so. take them for a walk, or I mean, no, no, no. They stay in the aquarium. They definitely stay in the aquarium. If I see a fish walking, I'm going to try to like eat, like hit it with something because fish don't walk. They're not supposed to walk, Olivia. Yeah. If I see a fish walking, I'm leaving. It's point blank. <laughs> yeah, but you have Mexican walking fish. Yes. All right. So Olivia will also do quite a bit for a taco if she is uh, properly motivated. Is that correct as well? That's right. All right. All right. I'm just reading the bio. I mean, I don't want to say I don't want to talk out of turn here. I don't know. I don't want to read into that too much. I mean, that's that's what's here. That's just what's on my sheet. I don't know. All right. So also, uh, is this recent? You recently landed the uh, the lead actress role in the podcast. um, Take Fortuitous Destiny. Mm-hmm. It's, um, um, tell us a little bit about that. Called Fortuitous Destiny, mm-hmm. and I play Destiny, and they're done through a podcast called Around This Joint. All right. And I'm excited. Yeah. Nice. And where can people hear that? I just shameless plug. Of course, yeah, plug it absolutely. So, are, are they hearing this <laughs> uh, just wherever podcasts are heard, or is there like a specific podcast platform? Wherever podcasts are heard. So all Spotify, over the place. There's a YouTube subscri- to s- channel to subscribe to Around This Joint. All right. Well, that's good. Congratulations. <laughs> Yeah, I'm excited. So also, also the you know the uh, the the queen mother of uh, Kringles, yes, as well. <laughs> the, babies. That's the babies, of course, of course. All right, so ladies and gentlemen, that is our panel of vets. Um, I am also a vet, but we don't need to talk about that. Uh, that was. Uh, that's a, Whoa, wait a minute. Why not? No, Why that's, not? That's a tale for another time. There was just you know. <laughs> Everyone said they were 18, and then the, the drinking charges were dropped. The restraining orders are gone now, so it's it's perfectly fine. So we're good to go. So uh, before we get started, again, uh, very important day, September 11th. Uh, we want to acknowledge that. This is something that never, ever, ever, ever needs to be forgotten. Uh, we go on with our lives. We do our, you know, We do our things. We do what we need to do. Um, obviously, in the current, you know, political and, you know, health crisis that, that are happening, you know, around the world, we've got we've got the COVID thing going on, you know, we've got, you know, you know, equality issues and racial issues. There's all this stuff going on, but I think at some point we need to take a moment and acknowledge the people who who did lose their lives. And the people who gave their lives to try to rescue and save more lives that could have potentially lost, been lost. Um, so I just want to go around and, and 
does everyone remember where they were on that day when that happened? Does anybody want to start and just, just say a few words about that? Richard, where were you? What was going on in, in your world on September 11th when that happened? I was delivering mail and a lady come running out of her house and she said a plane ran into a, a, a tower in New York City and I go, what the hell? Didn't didn't the pilots see the building? You know, I thought she was joking. So she says, no, you got to come in and see this, you know? So I went in her house and they were going to show the tape of the first plane hitting the tower. And then the sec- and I saw that live, the second plane hit the tower at nine Oh three on that day. And I could, I couldn't believe it. And I know exactly the address and the lady 1745 sure would have a boulevard in Euclid, Ohio, where I was delivering the mail, but I, but I couldn't believe what happened. I, di- I didn't understand it, you know? And, uh, the next day they took all the planes off, out of the air and, uh, at the post office, they took all of our mail off of commercial flights. So we had to set up a deal with FedEx for $18 billion for three years. Ooh. So we could fly our par- our, our mail on, a plane, you know, and, and a lot of people don't know that, that that happened, you know. I had no idea until, until just now. That's not something that you really hear about being publicized or anything like that. Well, they were afraid of bombs, you know, be, going through the mail. And then our whole system of how we in, intake the mail has been changed since that day. Even even now, it's there's policy that we we have to look for you know, different pieces of mail that we're trained to look for and stuff. So. So now in, in that moment, when you, when you, when you, the, you know, this, this woman comes running out to tell you like what you said, your initial reaction was, it must've been an accident. It must've been well, an accident initially, right? You, you hear about the first plane hitting the, hitting the tower. And then, then you see the second one at, at, at that point, what are you, what are you thinking? What are you feeling? You know, I, I kind of, I don't know, I go through life and I make jokes about everything, but it was like, what the hell, you didn't see the building? I mean, how could you miss a building? I mean, what type of pilot is this? It was a big building. You didn't see it? What the hell? So that's initially, that's how my crazy mind thinks, sure. you know, but then then when I saw the, the building of what was hit already, and they were going to show the tape of the first plane hitting it, live, I'm watching the second plane hit the other tower. And I'm like, oh, you know, it just was crazy. I mean, and then the second day, what was really eerie was being out delivering mail, looking up in the sky and not seeing one like trail, you know, how a plane has a trail in the right. sky. It just was nothing but clear. It was quiet. It was like, it just was a feeling of like, it was weird. I mean, it was really strange, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Olivia, how about you? Mm. <laughs> How about you? Where were you? What, you know, what, what was going on in your world when, when this happened? Oh my gosh. So what's crazy was when I joined the military, we, all we talked about was join for the education, join for the service for Navy. We, we were joining for education. That was it. Weren't really thinking about wartime or anything like that. I had just got to my duty station. I was working at Portsmouth hospital. I had um, my two boys. I remember that. And I remember one of the things I had to do in the pharmacy was deliver to each of the floors. And I went to a floor to go to deliver these um, crash cart things. And I remember seeing it on the TV and I remember seeing the, the plane going into the tower, like the first building. And I was thinking, this is the worst movie I have ever seen in my entire life. Wow. And I couldn't understand why everybody was so upset. Right. And then I remember seeing a second one and I saw a lady just crumble. And the way she screamed, I was like, what is wrong with her? And then I realized like, whoa, this is real. So I went back to my station where I was supposed to be in the pharmacy and my world stopped because this morning I had just dropped my kids off to their babysitter. I had just, I was actually irritated when I came in that day was like, did I take out the chicken for dinner? You know, whatever, you know, it's little stuff like that, you know, and when I came downstairs, my first thought was, I got to find my husband because he's active duty too. Somebody's got to get to the kids and we don't have a backup plan because we weren't ready for this. Right. No, I mean, Who was? military. Yeah. We do yeah. training and yeah. stuff. Who's, who's ready really for this? Who really thinks this stuff is really going to happen? Yeah. 
so I yeah I remember exactly where it was <laughs> was that it was it was when my military life changed from a selfish like I don't want to say selfish but me my family getting through this to a more broader perspective of this is what I do right and I had more respect for what I did actually by that time now, do you think in some ways that, you know, as tragic, as tra- horribly tragic as, as this event was, do you feel that in some way, it, even, even for a short period of time, it brought us together as a, as a nation? Like, we forget politics, Definitely. forget racial and economic issues, you know, do you feel that this Definitely. really galvanized Definitely. us, Definitely. brought us together? Yes, yes. It was, I felt like I was proud you know, the flag. I was proud to be in a service. Where wear my uniform every chance I could get, honey. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, I loved what I was doing. I mean, just the camaraderie about the a nation we felt as a whole. Like, yeah. okay, yeah, this happened, but guess what? We strike back. Yeah. yeah. I felt a change in it. <laughs> good, 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 good. Vaughn, sir, how about you? How about you? Where, what was, what was going on in your world and, and how did it change? How did it change when this happened? Yeah, so I actually was, uh, I was a reservist at the time. And you know, you know, as you all know, a reservist spends, you know, one weekend a month and two weeks out of the year. So what are the chances that I was on my two weeks of tour of duty at the time? That's where I was of oh. all times. So I was at a base in, I believe it was in Washington State, I believe it was. And I was it was on, I was staying in some barracks on the base. I couldn't stay on the ship at that time. They didn't have any place for us to stay there. And I remember getting up and, and I could hear like these alarms going on. And I guess I was getting dressed and we were headed. I headed to the ship, got there. And by the time I got there, everyone was huddled up in one of the one of the rooms and everyone was watching the TV at that time. Nothing was normal. Nothing as what your standard muster for station or anything along that line. Everybody was just like, come on board. And we we're all packed into this little small room watching this 12 inch color TV. And we we couldn't we all were just like what is going on like like most folks were just like this is not real this is something or like Richard said it was an accident of a pilot mm-hmm. or you know Olivia mentioned a bad movie <laughs> you know it was yeah. it was it was surreal yeah. and and then somewhere in there the calmness of what happened kind of became chaotic when we all watched the second plane come in and at that point this was uh, something changed at that moment. And as days went on, it, it was something that once we started to understand and realize what happened to see the country just come together and the outpouring of support, it, it, it did change. It was, I remember like Olivia said that when I joined the military, you know, growing up in the inner city, it was an outlet to get the hell out. And as I mentioned, the friends that I mentioned, we didn't go there with the thought of war or anything. Like when it happened and, and it started to, I remember even when Desert Storm came along, you know, the thought of going to war, we're like, whoa, 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 what do you mean war? What? Who, who joined the military for that? Right. <laughs> right. But uh, during that particular moment at 9-11, I do recall how the, the it was everybody was brothers and sisters no matter what and and every you know every first responder that we knew any military you know everybody it, it was it was a lot for us to to come to that realization of understanding that we are one and and that was i wish that at some point i wouldn't want anything as catastrophic as that to happen but the years after that was so different than the things that we are experiencing and feeling right now and if we still had that same feeling of connection that we had during that time, a lot of the things that I believe that we're dealing with now would not exist. It, it, it was, but I would never want anything as oh, yeah, you know, of gargantuan as that as to, to come to play in order for us to get to that connect, that place of connection again. So, but yeah, definitely 
I'll never forget that. I, I definitely remember where I was at that time. Mr. Deacon. Uh, wow. Um, well, as you well know, I was a, I was in Marines first and then um, the Army second. Yeah. And uh, I remember we were on a training exercise in Grafenwehr, Germany. Yeah, I, I was stationed in Germany. I spent like three years there. And uh, we had a little break. So we I think it was like a USO we went to, you know, they selling food and different stuff like Burger King, Subway, stuff like that. So I remember walking in, you know, we walking in, walking in with a couple of my soldiers, man. And, and I just see a gang of soldiers standing around the one flash, like not on the flash screen, but one TV that was in there. And I was like, man, what is this? Schwarzenegger movie or something, you know? And I'm like, for real. And, and like, and then next thing you know, you, you I seen a play and I was like, what the, f-? you know, like, damn. And I looked at my soldiers, I said, man, we going to war. And then like shortly after that, I remember Bush coming on there saying, get ready, be ready. And the next thing you know, about three or four months later, guess what? Marcus Deacon's black ass is on the plane. <laughs> and it took Kuwait. You know what I'm saying? And it's just, it's just like a such a surreal. It, it just, man, I ain't never seen so much sand in my life, dude, to so many training. You know, it's just, it's depressing and make you want to cry, dude. A grown man cry. You know what I'm saying? But it's just, and it just smells different. It just like, wow, I can't believe y'all actually got me over here. You know what I'm saying? And I remember when we finally um, got on that plane and um, that same day, my wife, my, my first wife called me and told me that she was pregnant with my <laughs> with my baby girl, you know, and I said, I'm damn, you know, so and then I had to leave her. I think she was only a few months old when I left, you know, so and you're just watching your kids cry, man, and not knowing if you're going to come home, man. And thank God, you know, I was blessed to be able to you know, nothing that too bad happened to me. Sure. But um, yeah, it's just a, it's just. It's still, and I still was in shock. Like, man, they just smashed them planes in that built. Like, wow. You know, like, and, and, and it's like he said, like, the dude, like, you flying too low, something wrong with the pilot? And then we just found out. I think one of the issues was somebody had some box cutters that they, how did they hold the, the crew hostage like that? And I'm still wondering, you know, and it, it just blows my mind. But um, shout out to all the veterans and uh, people yeah. that I know that serve with me. I appreciate y'all. Thanks for getting me home. I appreciate y'all. Yeah. So, when when we talk about something like this, like 9-11, you know, it's obvious that we as Americans, we kind of live in this bubble of of ignorance. You know, I mean, it's like we know what's going on out there in the world, but, you know, that's not going to happen here. That could never happen to us here. I mean, it's it's like this is America. That, that doesn't happen here. And then just like that, it happens here. And. You know, Vaughn, like you said, it's, you know, it's like we in in no universe do we do any of us ever want anything like that to ever happen again. You know, not just on U.S. soil, but I mean, you know, good people don't want to see anything like that happen anywhere to anybody in the world. But why why do we think that it takes something like that to bring us together as a nation? You know, why does it take that level of tragedy for us to all see each other as Americans, as brothers and sisters, as, you know, a people, as we the people, you know, why is that? Who wants to weigh in on that? Who, Richard, what about you? Why do you think that is? Why, why does it take something like that to make us react, to make us be American? I, I think that, um, you know, it's, it's kind of like, you can fight with your brother, but if somebody messes with your family, it's different. You know, you know what I mean? It's kind of like, you know, we, we fight here internally in, in the country, but if you mess with all of us, it's like, Hey, right. all of a sudden those, maybe those minor disagreements that we might have, they go away because now you're, you're coming after our livelihood, our standard of living, our, our country, our, what we love, what, you know, our dedication and stuff like that. So it's funny cause you could fight with your brother, you know, and, you know, and you really have a bad fight with him. But if somebody outside of the family was messing with your brother, all of a sudden you, you're kind of glued together as a family, you know what I mean? Right. I think, I don't know. I guess I just kind of threw that out there. I don't know. No, I mean, that makes sense. I, I think that makes perfect sense because in, in that moment, you know, when when we were targeted, you know, they weren't 
they were targeting Americans. You know, there was no discrimination. You know, there was no, you know, it, it, there was no discrimination against race, gender, age, political, you know, religious background, you know, your, you know, your financial standing, you know, it was people in that building, in those buildings in the Pentagon, you know, these were people all walks of life, the rich, the poor, black folks, white folks, people that weren't even citizens, you know, people of different socioeconomic backgrounds. In that moment, there was, that was an attack on, like you said, on Americans and the world. And it kind of, it kind of makes you think the world sees us as Americans. You know what I mean? They don't see like we, people are, are, are squabbling over like gender issues, you know, d- different gender equality issues. And, you know, obviously, you know, racism, systemic racism in this country is a huge, huge problem, you know, but, Outside of the states, and for those of us who have been overseas, you know, been stationed overseas or, or whatever, you know, they don't see us. They don't see us like that. They just see us as Americans. You know, they see us as, as spoiled children stomping across the planet. Basically, that's, that's how they see America. So, you know, when do we see each other like that? You know, at what point are we going to look at each other as you know, you're an American, you're an American, you're an American, you know, and, and I hate that it has to, it takes something like this. It takes, you know, this, this catastrophic event for us to see each other as Americans. I don't yeah, know. My, my thought is, I, I mean, you know, I, I am in, in different circles and I, and I have these kind of conversations and dialogue and it is, you know, after, the lights and cameras go off. You you sit there because you're you you do have these conversations in in, in front of people, and you, you speak of hope and promise for our country. And but then, in the like as I mentioned, the lights and the cameras go off. You do go to a place of this deep despair of you know what what's the reality? How do we really get back to that place where someone looks at me on an evil equal even playing field and i look at them the same way as a brother as a sister you know of no matter the social economic situation or their ethnicity or age or sexual orientation and you know it it, it deep inside it definitely it bothers me and it concerns me you know no matter how i what I say in open and public and in, in front of a room or a camera that somewhere in my brain, I want to believe that we can get back to that place without something crazy happening. But, you know, we are, we're all individuals and it's difficult to believe that I can somehow change your way of thinking of how you grew up, your culture, your background, your environment, and somehow I'm going to have a speech one day and it's going to shift the way you think to be more understanding of me. And, and somehow I'm concerned that I don't know if I can do that. Right. I like to think that I'm persuasive enough in a dialogue or conversation to be able to do that. But how do a five, 10 minute dialogue change 20, 30 years of conditioning? Right. And those are the kind of things that concern me. Something extreme when we talk about 9-11 how extreme that was and the outpouring of everyone. No one looked at each other differently. We were all here to support. We hugged, we loved. Mm-hmm. You know, people remember, remember some of the things that people were doing, the outpouring. People were sending money to people they didn't even know. Yeah. You know, people were doing so much beyond, the, you know, now we'll have someone pay for your groceries and everything you're in front of and those kind of things. But, and that's cool. No, don't, don't get me wrong. That's cool. But, I remember then, man, the outpouring was, I mean, emotional. It was, it was beyond thought of where we were. And the last thing I would ever think is that I would do something that would cross anyone as a brother or a sister of any ethnicity or sexual orientation, social economic difference. You know, none of that would cross my mind if I could help. 
And that's my comparison, right? That is my standard. And my question in my brain all the time is, how do we get back to that standard? And I'm deeply concerned. And I'm always listening. And if you guys mention something, I'm going to write it down because I would love to get something that I can take back to another circle and be able to say, hey, this came up and this was something that was talked about. Maybe this is an approach. Richard, yeah. I just want to say that, you know, when I, when I look at the world, you know, it, it's, I always thought like I could change the whole world, but you can't. You know, the only thing that I try to do is in my little circle, Wherever I go, I try to treat people how I want to be treated, okay? I say hi to people. I don't even know them. Sometimes they don't say hi back. I don't take offense at that because they might have had a bad day, okay? But I learned that when I was in the Air Force because I was away from my home. I grew up in the inner city too, and it was a way to get out, get out of that mentality, get away from that environment, get away from the gangs. I was around gangs. We had all that stuff, okay? Yeah. Well, in the military, my God, there's different types of people in the world because you got a narrow view when you're in that situation. So when I was at the base, my neighborhood was a neighborhood where you could, I knew everybody in the whole neighborhood, okay? I go on a, I'm way, I'm away from home. I'm like, I miss my home. So that base, I went around and everybody on that base, I said, hi, how you doing? The woman at the, at the uh, BX, I go over to the, uh, the recreation thing. I go to child everywhere I went. I talked to people, said hi to them, get to know them. They knew me. I knew them. All of a sudden, that big base became a neighborhood. And I think that wherever we live, we have to reach out to our neighbors, and and just the courtesy, a common courtesy. Good morning. How you doing? Smile. Like I said, a lot of people, I walk every day. I do my four miles. I do four miles under, under an hour every day. I'm walking in my neighborhood, and I don't care who they are. I don't even know them. I always say, hi, how you doing? Good morning. And like I said, a lot of people say, oh, fine. You have a nice day, you know, or whatever. But some people won't say anything. I don't take offense on that. But it takes, it takes a while because people, you got to build up credibility with people. Like when I delivered mail every day, you know, like the people were like, where's my mail on the next street? You know, I, I got on a route where people were really screwing up, but I, I fixed it. Okay. But every day the woman would say, where's my mail on the next street? I go, no, ma'am, I have your mail here. Have a nice day. So it was establishing credibility with people, you know, and that's, I think that's like a basic fundamental with everybody. And it's funny because I had a lot of bias myself, you know, but it was funny because one day we were like in a, the movie room and we were talking about this fight that was on the TV or as a TV room. We we're talking about this fight that was on the TV and this guy I had a hard time with, we were agreeing on who should win the fight. When the lights went up, here was this guy that was giving me the bad eye. I was giving him the bad eye. And I was like, and we looked at each other and said, hey, you know, it's funny because it broke that tension or that that facade. It's like a, people put up a wall where they don't want to break through that wall. And and communicate that's what communication is about, is is getting beyond that wall. So how do you break that? You break it with common courtesy. Good morning. How you doing? Hey, have a nice day. Whether or not they say anything back to you that might affect them later. You're planting a seed in their mind. You know, so, you know, somebody cared about me. Somebody said, good morning. The next day, hey, good morning. Oh, good morning. You know, maybe they feel like now you've broken through that, that you know, that yeah. wall that yeah. people put up. You know, uh, that's my two cents. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe, maybe that's something that we as veterans can do. This is, this will just, this will be my final thoughts. We got to wrap up. Um, <laughs> we, 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 as veterans, we, you know, we, we were taught how to lead, you know, whether, whether you were a, an E1, you know, or an O9, I mean, it, it, does, it doesn't matter, you know, when, when you get out, you know, and that could be a whole other conversation is, you know, that transition from military to civilian life. Some of us deal with it, but I, I've never adjusted. I mean, to this day, I still haven't adjusted to civilian life. Um, and to this day, I feel like my military family 
is stronger than my civilian family. I mean, you know, my actual blood relations, I, I, I'd get rid of all of them to have my military family back. You know, I'm still very close to my military family. And I think that, you know, it's that military life, that's that great equalizer. You know, because, again, it doesn't matter what your religion is. It doesn't matter what color your skin. There's a lot of racism in the military, of course. But when it comes down when it comes down to it, um, that person standing next to you, that's the person that's going to save your life. Whether you're on a ship, whether you're in a, a foxhole, whether you're in the back of a, a dusty vehicle, somewhere in the middle of bumfuck, you know, wherever, you know, those are the people that you're relying on and all the other differences you had. I used to get into it with this dude. He was like a hardcore redneck. I couldn't stand that dude. I couldn't stand him. He would always like spit like chaw, chaw spit on my boots. He's like, you know, <laughs> you know, I'm like, get out of here. You fucking red, leave me alone. You know, quit messing with me. But when we were in Somalia and when, when shit got real, I knew I could count on him, and he knew he could count on me. And I think that as veterans, I think we need to bring that into the world. I think we need to we need to do more with that. I think we have that responsibility, you know, to take that mentality that we have, take that leadership mentality that we have. And yes, we all have differences. We're all different. We all have different cultures, and those cultures all need to be celebrated, you know, and recognized. But at the same time, can we as veterans maybe move forward and start leading the people and saying, look, y'all are being stupid. This is dumb right now. Let's, let's come together and do this and make this happen, you know, because we had to do that, you know, as, as veterans, when we were in, we had to do that. You know, we had to look past all of our other cultural differences to accomplish the mission. And we did it daily. We did it every single day of our of our entire career. I don't care if you were in for six months, you know, or 16 years. Every single day, we had to look past each other's differences to accomplish the mission. Every single day. And that's still in us. Each and every person on this panel, that's still in us. So maybe that maybe we can do something with that. I mean, I don't know what. Maybe we I don't know what. I don't have I don't have that answer. So I I tried to get rid of it as fast as I could. I'm just going to be 100 with you. That's all right. I got out when I got out. That was one of the happiest days of my life. I I, I shit you not. But it's still in you. But it's still in you. Yeah. 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 A little bit. Yeah. But um, as far as you was talking about, and I know you said you had to go. Remember this. It said the enemy, my enemy is my friend. Remember that. You're right. that's, That's real. You're right. So I want to go around real quick. Um, I want you guys to plug your stuff, Richard. What you got going on? Uh, do you have uh, Do you have anything? Uh, any productions coming up or anything? Any anywhere where anyone can find you to find out more about you? I have a page on Facebook. It's uh, at 007 RTP. I have all my movies on there. Oh, very and good. I, I do most. I do mostly movies. I do some background. I. In, in Hollywood films, I've been doing background. I, I've read for major parts, but so far I haven't landed a major part yet. But right. that's what my dream is eventually, you know. So You'll get there. You'll get there. All right. Olivia, how about you? One more time. What you got going on? Uh, well, you know, I said the plug about the podcast, but what I wanted to actually mention was um, yes. this date is actually, you know, for a military veteran and our brothers and sisters out there. You know, this date and many other dates are markers and they're triggers. And we just need to keep remember and just reach out to our brothers and sisters and let them know that we're here and just an ear. You know, we don't have to be all gushy and, you know, whatever, but just let them know that there's someone there to talk. And as veterans, that we do need to talk. And as service members, we do need to talk and acknowledge these triggers as they exist, you know, um, that's my two cents. No, that's <laughs> and that's beautiful. And you are a thousand percent correct. We need each other. You know, we really do. Yes, I mean, do. as as veterans, as active duty reservists, we need each other because nobody understands us the way that we understand each other. No because... one understands us better than anybody else. <laughs> nobody. I have actually been um still I've been in longer than I've been out. <laughs> yeah. And the transition is difficult. Yeah. And it it I don't no, I think it's getting easier, but I haven't really seen anything. So, but just, you know, keep an eye out, an eye out for your other veterans out there. 
And around this joint, check me out. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Vaughn, what you got going on? Hey, this I feel some kind of way because I don't have shit going on. That's I mean, right. I'm just a regular dude. Right? I have no social media to speak of that would say, hey, follow me, check me out, or come see me or anything like that. But, um, but I just want to give appreciation to all you guys for what you've done, your service. And I believe it, that's a huge point. Thank you for that, the trigger, right? Because I have so many of my friends that you mentioned that are my buddies, my friends, my family that are service members. And I never really like, you know, I don't know nobody's birthday. Hell, I don't know my family member's birthday, but there are things that happen throughout the year that I can use as, as, a, as, a, as a, a point to say, hey, reach out to them and just say, hey, how you been, what's going on? Nothing crazy, but just the connection. So with that, you know, I appreciate that as well. And, you know, that's all I got. Now follow you guys, as you guys have mentioned, look you guys up for sure. Outstanding. And Vaughn, let me let me uh, let me say one thing. I'm going to yell at you here for a second. I'm going to yell at you for a second. Um, you are not just an ordinary dude. You're just not you're not just a reg. You are an extraordinary man and you are a gotcha. hero. OK, and I got you. Please, please. You know, you can still be humble about it, but please acknowledge the fact that you're not just a regular dude. You're a hero. You've done. I, I appreciate that. You've done things that, that, that normal people could, that regular people could never do. So you are. But that that's the superpower of us all, right? Is that people recognize us as that, but we remain in that place of humility. Yeah. And I think that's one of the things that people love and connect with us for that reason, because they see so much more in us, and we still maintain a level of saying, "Hey." I'm here for you just as a regular person. So it's our superpower. And, I, and I'm glad you recognized it, though. And this this safe place that we're all in, thank you for that. Because Yes, <laughs> that, that is your superpower to be humble. But as your military brother, it is my superpower to call out the hero that you yeah, are. <laughs> so just take it. <laughs> Got you. Just I'm take it. it. Mr. Deacon, Mr. Deacon, plug that show. Well, you know, you can catch me on the Spotify, iHeartRadio, Radio Line, and Speaker. As Mr. At the Mr. Deacon Experience, you can catch me. You can hit me on Facebook and Twitter and be on the lookout. It's football season. And you know I do. The Browns <laughs> is trash. The Browns is on your ass video. So I'm going to have to change it up and make it like it's going to be called uh, Cleveland 100. So it's going to be a little bit more comprehensive. So I just, you know, just like it be clown. So just make sure you tune in and I give you a laugh or two. But we're going to keep it 100 always. All right. Outstanding. All right. Um, so on behalf of everybody here at the Circle of Nerds, I want to thank all of our panelists, Richard, Olivia, Mr. Deacon, Vaughn. Thank you guys so much for taking the time to join us this week. You guys could have done anything else in the world, uh, but you, uh, you made some time for us. So I really appreciate it. So and for you watching this and for uh, listening to this on our podcast network, uh, thank you as well, because you could be doing anything also, but uh, for whatever reason, you're listening to us do what we do. So thank you. And for all of our fellow veteran brothers and sisters, active duty, reserve, guard, um, if you need us, we are here for you. Uh, no matter what, you're, you're not going through this alone. You know, there is still an army of us out there uh, for you at all times. So you're never, you're never going to go through this alone. Um, the struggle is real whether it's PTSD, whether it's that transition from military to civilian life, it's real and we get it. We understand you. We get you. So uh, come talk to us, please. Don't do it by yourself. We love you. So, and with that, with all that mushy gushy stuff out of the way, uh, we will see y'all next week right here. Nerds on ice. Thanks again for joining us, everybody. Bye. Thank you. To hear all of our podcasts, look for Circle of Nerds on iTunes, iHeart, Pandora, Spotify, or wherever you get podcasts. And if you want to see these weirdos in their natural habitat, just look for Circle of Nerds on YouTube and Patreon. Make sure to subscribe so you never miss an episode.